Believe in Brett Yormark, baby. That's what this show, at least the start of this show, is all about. I'm Pete Mundo. HeartlandCollegeSports.com is, of course, how you find us. And thanks for joining us on Facebook Live, YouTube, the podcast. We appreciate you joining us, however you're getting this content. And what a celebratory day, celebratory moment it is for the Big 12 Conference. Because the Big 12 has locked up, according to Sports Business Journal and many other outlets since then, a new six-year media rights agreement with ESPN and Fox. They have beaten the Pac-12 to the punch. The Big 12 is in great hands, and believe in bread is my new slogan here at heartlandcollegesports.com. It is so good to be with you as always. So here are the details, and then we'll get to what it means. The deal for the Big 12 with ESPN and Fox, six years, it runs through 2031. It's worth $2.3 billion. That's an annual average of $380 million. It runs through 2024, 2025, the current deal, and then the new six-year extension goes through 2031. You look at this, and first off, the Big 12, the early negotiating window didn't technically begin until February of 2024. Brett Yormark said, I want to get a deal done right now. I want to move this thing forward. I want this league to be stable. He took over August 1st. Not even three months later, he's got a new agreement with ESPN and Fox. It is a huge development considering you look at where this league was 15 months ago. 15 months ago, nobody thought the Big 12 Conference would possibly exist today. But here we are with a Big 12 Conference that is thriving, that is healthy, that is as deep as any league in America, and has a commissioner that is savvy, smooth, gets it, and is a media guy before he's a college sports guy. And this is one of the reasons. You know, when Brett Yormark came on board, this is one of the reasons I like the hire. I understand he didn't have any real ties to the Big 12, or really college sports for that matter. But I said, the Big 12's got to be different, has to go outside the box, has to think big. And while there were great candidates in college sports, 80s and things like that, getting a guy like Brett Yormark to re-envision and not reinvent, you know, you're not reinventing anything with college athletics. It is what it is. But just understand the media side of it better than someone who would be an AD and understands is uh, maybe more of the college side of it. That's where I saw the value in Brett Yormark, and it's already paid enormous dividends. Enormous dividends. So you look at this right now, and uh, you think about some of the details in this deal. First off, the Big 12, according to reports, wanted a shorter deal. So they go six years. That runs through 2031. That means the Big 12 will be back on the market ahead of the SEC, whose deal with ESPN goes through 2034, and the ACC whose ESPN deal expires in 2036. It will be a year behind the Big Ten for for what that is worth. And clearly, it's also going to be more of an ESPN deal than it's going to be a Fox deal. Uh, ESPN will have first dibs for football and basketball. ESPN will get the top four football picks each season, six of the top eight picks, eight of the top 12 picks, and 12 of the top 20 picks. Also, ESPN gets the rights to Big 12 football championship game, and the basketball tournament championship game. But here's what's new. Fox is getting some Big 12 basketball games on Fox and FS1 for the first time. So that's a new development here in this deal. Uh, That's pretty cool. You know, right now, Fox does a very good job with uh, the Big East, but they're also going to get some Big 12 basketball. So that'll be good, I believe, for both sides. So what does this mean Big picture. First off, it puts the Pac-12 in a very precarious position. The Pac-12 is in a tough spot because the Pac-12 was the one who was in the middle of negotiations with the TV networks and never came to a deal. The Pac-12 was the one who was out there saying, oh, you know, we'll get a deal done before the Big 12 and that'll lock us up and then everything will be fine and no one's going to talk about poaching the Pac-12. Well, that's that's done. That's over. Now you've got a situation where the Pac-12 still has no deal. The Big 12, the ACC, the Big 10, and the SEC are all locked up. And there's a lot of Pac-12 homers out there. A lot, I'm, You know who they are. I don't need to rename them. The Mandels of the world and uh, 
Uh, let's see. Oh, John Wilner's of the world. I mean, those guys are out there doing their thing. They're trying to poo-poo this. Uh, Wilner, Wilner had a report, or he had a tweet up on Sunday morning that said after this deal came down, he thinks the Pac-12 can beat the Big 12's number of about $32 million per school. Based on what, my man? Like, what is that possibly based off of? How could you say, how could you say the Pac-12's in a spot to make more money per school than the Big 12 just got in this deal? That is insane to come to that conclusion. But it's very on brand for a guy who's had his head buried in the sand about what the future is of the Pac-12. Now, for those of you asking, because I know this is a question we've already gotten, and this is an important part of the equation here. There is. The Big 12's new deal will have a pro-rata clause in the event of future expansion. That's important. And that's something that should be noted, and everybody should be screaming from the rooftops. If the Big 12 expands, the money on a per-school basis continues on and grows. That's huge. That is absolutely enormous for the Big 12. I don't see what the future is for the Pac-12. I mean, I'm looking around, and I'm looking on social media, and the Pac-12 goobers are like, well, you know, now the Pac-12 is the only the only conference on the market and going to the market's good and Amazon Prime's going to get in the mix and all these different things. Pump the brakes here. Pump the brakes for a second. Why? Tell me what leverage the Pac-12 right now is bringing to the table. Now, if you want to say it's the only school, only conference available and that makes them more valuable, yeah, but the time slots are filling up very quickly on ESPN and Fox. So they may say, yeah, you know, we'd like you, but we're good. On top of that, is Amazon Prime going to get into the mix? By the way, have you followed Amazon stock here lately? Not doing too well. Is Thursday Night Football treating them great? I would argue not so far. Like, I think Brett Yormark's understanding that in five, six years, or, geez, almost 10 years to the next deal, it is true that the Amazons and the Apples are only going to grow as players in the sports landscape, live sports landscape. That is true. But it doesn't feel like it's there yet. It doesn't feel like we're in that moment right now. We're going streaming exclusively is the right play. And as much as I've been highly critical of ESPN and how I believe that ESPN behind the scenes tried to screw the Big 12 over a year ago and tried to basically make the Big 12 extinct over a year ago. And I still stand by that. I understand the business play because here's the other thing. Brett Yormark keeps talking about making this conference national. The best way to do it is to bite your tongue and stay in bed with ESPN and Fox. Even if you think ESPN has screwed you here, that's the best play in terms of looking at this conference and saying what makes the most sense if you truly want to be a national conference. If you go to streaming only, you're only going to get people that genuinely want to find you. Unless you're the NFL where you're such a brand and it's such a product that the NFL, I mean, (laughs) the NFL could, I'm trying to think here, just some type of analogy. If the NFL said the only way you could watch us is by driving to your local prison and watching on a black and white TV from 1962, they'd still get 10 to 20 million people to watch their games every week. Like, I mean, those are the, the top NFL games are doing those kind of crazy numbers. That, that's how crazy that brand is, how popular that brand is. Big 12 doesn't have that right now. Brett Yormark understands that. So as much as... The recent history has been tumultuous between the Big 12 and uh, the rest of, you know, ESPN, Fox to a lesser degree. It makes sense right now to keep that relationship going, to continue on as is. But I I am just stunned at the spin some of our Pac-12 media friends are trying to make of this news this morning. This is huge. Uh, Jamie Pollard, who is the Iowa State Athletic Director, He had some great uh, tweets this morning. He said that now each Big 12 school is going to be looking at easy 40, 50 mil per year. Now, I understand the Big 10 and the SEC are going to be 80-ish, but considering 
when OU and Texas leave, there were predictions that the Big 12 might be lucky to get 10 to 15 million. That's crazy. This is great. Here's the tweet from Jamie Pollard. Huge day for Cyclone Athletics in the Big 12 with college football playoff and NCAA. This will bring our annual Big 12 revenue to close to $50 million per school, up from $41 million this year. Congrats to Brett Yormark for delivering in the clutch. And Jamie Pollard also pointed out something important. This does not happen without Bob Bowlesby. He acted quickly in securing BYU, UCF, Houston, and Cincinnati. Total team effort. Well said there. Very nice job by Jamie Pollard doing the right thing. None of this happens without Bob Bowlesby. Bob Bowlesby, when the chips went on the table, you know, Bob Bowlesby, I always thought, got kind of a bad rap. He did what Texas know you wanted him to do, not expanding a few years ago. Then they turned around and stabbed him in the back. That's not his fault. He acted quickly. He punched ESPN in the mouth. He acted swiftly. He was aggressive. He got BYU and Cincinnati and UCF and Houston, did a great job, got outstanding brands, and the Big 12 is alive and well. It's thriving. And to me, after the Big 10 and the SEC, it is going to be, and it will be, the strongest conference in college athletics. I firmly stand by that. And this year, obviously, has been a heck of a year. This is a great day for the Big 12 conference. And uh, it's thanks to Bob Bowlesby. It's thanks to Brett Yormark. It's thanks to the ADs, the presidents, everybody who did a great job. When the Big 12 was on the verge of extinction, it, it all, literally extinction 15 months ago, cooler heads prevailed, everybody stuck together, and this league is going to thrive. There's no doubt in my mind this league is going to thrive. Pete Mundo, HeartlandCollegeSports.com. Covering the Big 12 is how you join us. A great day to be a Big 12 fan. So let's go through the games now. Let's talk about these games. Let's dive into Oklahoma, Iowa State. Shall we start there? Uh, first off, the picks went three and one against the spread. So we've had three straight weeks going three and one. That means that our picks against the spread are nine and three the last three weeks. How about that? That's impressive stuff. We'll take that. Um, then, you know, you look at this game itself. Oklahoma wins 27-13. to It was a two-score game for most of the game, but it felt like Iowa State might have been down five touchdowns. Like, this Iowa State offense is such a disaster. And it's because of the running game. They can't get anything going on the ground. Another bad game on the ground, 27 carries, 66 yards, two and a half yards per carry. I mean, how, how many times are we going to say the same thing over and over and over again? Iowa State rushing attack is nothing. And, like, I think Hunter Deckers can be a solid Big 12 quarterback, but he's clearly pressing. Clearly. And you're watching this guy, and he's, you know, he threw three interceptions in the game. His quarterback, his QBR, quarterback rating was 36 and a half. I think I saw Hunter Deckers has had a QBR under 50 in four of his last five games. I'm not going to pin that totally on him because he's not working with a whole lot. But at some point, you know, Matt Campbell and Tom Manning have got to figure out what to do with this offense because Oklahoma's defense is not good. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, look at Brent Venables. He's turned around the defense after a bye week. I, I, not really. I mean, you know, I'll take you out to Olathe North here in the Kansas City area, and their defense would look pretty darn good against Iowa State's offense. I Like, I... I don't know. It's just, it's really underwhelming. Now I'll say this. You want me to give some credit to the Iowa State uh, offense? Sure. I'll give some credit to the Iowa State offense. One in particular, uh, they went for it on fourth down from their own 47-yard line. That was encouraging to see. It's also a belief on the defensive side of the ball, but at least they're doing some things like that that you have to do to try to get things going when you're Iowa State on offense. But, you know, the Cyclones, the defense is there, as it seems to be every week. But eventually, it's going to get worn down. Oklahoma, to its credit, did look good. Uh, Eric Gray had a great game. Dylan Gabriel was okay. Uh, Jaleel Farouk was impressive through the air for the Sooners. But Oklahoma did enough. I mean, if you told me OU would score 27 in this game, I would have said they would win because I don't think Iowa State can get to 30 points. And you can't win in the Big 12 if you don't have an offense that can score you 30 points. It's not like I understand the Big 12 is not what it was 
10 years ago or even five years ago. Defense is a thing in the Big 12, despite what the national media tells you. But I, relying on this defense to hold teams in the Big 12 to, to less than 20 points, I mean, that's just asking too much. It's asking too much of your defense. So at some point, things have to start to turn around, and I don't see how it's this season. I know Iowa State fans are, are rotting Tom Manning hard. I don't see him going anywhere. Him and Campbell go back years and years and years. But just getting some fresh perspective, rethinking things in the offseason, that would be valuable. That would be valuable. Because Iowa State is now 0-5 in Big 12 play. They're 3-5 and overall. And, you know, I mean, I get it being a rebuild season. We know how many close losses they had. I mean, they've had, what, four Big 12 losses by a total of 14 points. Then they lost yesterday's game by 14 points. But at some point, you know, if it's not working, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. So, uh, you know, Oklahoma, to its credit, they're 2-3. and three. I, I, I can't see any way, even if OU wins out, they end up playing for a Big 12 championship game. But uh, And I still don't think OU's all that good, to be honest. I just think Iowa State is in a real rut right now. But kudos to the Sooners. They get the win. Uh, Brent Venables, you know, he, he's got a string together. He's got, what, four games left in the Big 12. He's got to go 3-1 and one to, to at least make the fan base feel better about this season, get a big bowl win or a good bowl win, and then go to the offseason and get your guys in here. That's what Brent Venables has to do. Next up on our uh, Week 9 games in the Big 12, TCU West Virginia. Before we get to the game itself, can I just thank Sonny Dykes? Now, wh- why would I thank Sonny Dykes? I'm thanking Sonny Dykes for throwing it to the end zone on fourth and one. I know it was a free play after an offsides, but Sonny Dykes got me the cover, baby. And he hopefully got you the cover on TCU minus seven and a half. As I noted, our picks were three and one against the spread. And, I mean, that's a bad beat if you had West Virginia plus seven. I admit it. It's a bad beat. If you missed the end of the game, TCU's up 34-31, 20 seconds left, fourth and one at the WVU 29-yard line. And uh, TCU goes for it, offsides on West Virginia, free play. And then Max Duggan tosses it to the end zone. Savion Williams comes down with the ball. And... uh, TCU scores a touchdown. They go up 41-31. That's the ball game. TCU covers. I saw Dave Portnoy, live reaction to that, the Barstool owner. He was on West Virginia. And I was just like, yep, no sympathy here for Portnoy. A couple of birds for that guy as far as I'm concerned. See you later, pal. Take a hike. All right, that's why you got to follow our Big 12 picks. We're on fire lately, 9-3 and three against the spread the last three weeks. Just ride them. We're rolling. No sympathy here for Portnoy. You go against us, that's what happens, my man. Sonny Dykes getting it done, covering the spread in a big way. How about that? Now, for the game, I got to give West Virginia this. They got off the bus. They showed up. They had some fight. But everything I've seen from West Virginia fans suggests that uh, there is no love lost still with Neil Brown. I don't see how he continues after this season. And uh, this was one of those games where even if Neil Brown had won it, I'm not sure it would have done a lot to convince West Virginia fans that he's the guy for the future. But then you look at the game itself and you say to yourself, okay, I mean, you know, West Virginia led this game early, led this game early uh, 7 nothing, and then they also had a lead of uh, 14 to 7. But when TCU goes down in the first half, that's where they want you. TCU trailed by 17 and 18 points, respectively, the last couple of weeks came back to win the games. So even down, you know, a touchdown in the first half a couple times, I wasn't really concerned for TCU. I was concerned a bit about the spread, but I wasn't concerned about them winning the game. But West Virginia, I mean, you know, they played well. C.J. Donaldson is a, I think he's going to be a stud running back. He already is a stud running back. Uh, J.T. Daniels was, was decent throughout the afternoon, but you know, the problem for West Virginia still, although they were a little bit better in this department yesterday, uh, they still tr- struggle at times getting to the quarterback. I mean, that's just that's just how it works. And it's been that way all season for the Mountaineers. Now, for TCU, 
can we start talking about this offense with not just Max Nuggan, not just Quentin Johnston, but also Kendra Miller? This guy is the most underappreciated, underrated offensive weapon in the league. 12 carries, 120 yards on Saturday, a touchdown run of 51 yards. Uh, you know, broke the game open. TCU never trailed again after his big touchdown. Like, I'm, I'm all good with Duggan and Johnston getting a lot of attention on offense, but Kendra Miller is right there with them. The guy is right at the top of the Big 12 in terms of running backs with B. John Robinson and Deuce Vaughn, and he gets no attention. And I don't understand why. He's certainly worthy of it in my book. Worthy of that and a lot more. So uh, you know, this TCU team is clicking, but my question is this for TCU. You're playing with fire every week, and how long can you keep doing that? Like TCU cannot continue to put itself in early holes. At some point, they're going to lose a game. And you know, as, as good as the Horned Frogs are, as great as they played, they're 8-0. Nobody predicted this for this TCU team in Sunny Dykes. You got to get out of the gates faster. It reminds me a little bit, but obviously, you know, not completely synonymous, but in the NFL, I'm here in Kansas City, Kansas City Chiefs, slow start. And they're fine. You know, you got Mahomes, you got Kelsey, you got that offense, they come back, but it's a lot to ask week in, week out. And here's the difference. In the NFL, you know, you go 12 and five, you can get to a Super Bowl. TCU, if they drop one game, they better be the Big 12 champs. You know, if they drop one game in the regular season, they got to then run the table, be a one-loss Big 12 champ, and then also potentially need some help around college football. I hate saying that, but we know how the game is played with the college football playoff committee. Just TCU fans know that as well as anybody. In 2014, they're the third-ranked team in the country. They beat Iowa State 55-3. to and they fall in the final rankings to sixth. It's ridiculous. They're not, a, and I hate that we have to have this conversation, but it's it's a real conversation to have. So, and TCU at eight and zero, any team that's eight and zero in a Power Five conference should be thinking college football playoff. So TCU's got to figure out how to get out of the rut early, not get off to these slow starts because at some point. You're going to get off to a slow start, and you're not going to be able to come back from it. And that is uh, not something I want to see happen for a TCU team that, you know, has an enormous amount of talent. But now, you know, now from here on out for TCU, it's going to be a fascinating final month of the season. Because you've got uh, the three Texas schools, other three Texas schools in the Big 12 left. Texas Tech, at Texas, at Baylor, home to Iowa State to wrap up the season. So, uh, and you know those Texas schools are going to want to beat each other up. No doubt about that. Okay, next up on our Big 12 Football Week 9 reaction show. Speaking of slow starts, Oklahoma State, slow start and slow finish. In fact, Oklahoma State, who got blown out by K-State 48-0. Oklahoma State never got inside the Kansas State 38-yard line. That is embarrassing that is pathetic this was but also I'm going to give Kansas State a lot of credit this was as good of a performance as I have seen from any Big 12 team this season it was that outstanding watching Kansas State just completely own Oklahoma State on Saturday in Manhattan I mean, that was unbelievable. Oklahoma State came in averaging like 460 yards of offense per game. They had a total of 217 on Saturday. Put that in. I mean, just think about that. They had basically 250 yards less on Saturday than they have per game. That is incredible what Kansas State did on the defensive side of the ball. And then, you know, I, I don't want to create a quarter quarterback controversy where there isn't one. But first off, I'm so impressed with Will Howard's passing abilities. I mean, he's come a long way from where he was the last couple of years. I, if you told me that you wanted Will Howard to be the guy going forward over Adrian Martinez, I don't think I'd agree with you. But if you made the case to me, I'd say, okay, I'll listen. 
Like, I will absolutely listen to that argument right now based on what I've seen from Will Howard. Now, I understand the Oklahoma State defense, especially that secondary, has been a weak weak point all, all year. But with what Will Howard was doing to TCU last week on the road before he got hurt, and then what he did on Saturday against Oklahoma State, those aren't mistakes. Those aren't accidents. That was beyond impressive from Will Howard. He was 21 of 37, threw for nearly 300 yards, four touchdowns, no picks, QBR of 92. Unbelievable. And then Deuce Vaughn just did what Deuce Vaughn does. 22 carries, 158 yards, a touchdown. I mean, Deuce Vaughn is the most explosive player in this league. And even the weapons on the outside, Cade Warner's breaking out. He had a couple touchdown grabs. Malik Knowles, Phillip Brooks spreading the ball around very well. You've got Deuce Vaughn and the ability to catch the ball, you know, in the flat out of the backfield. Uh, K-State is a beast to deal with, and you can't do the what-if thing, but what if Will Howard doesn't get hurt against TCU? Is Kansas State right now 7-1 and overall? They're only lost to a top 25 team in Tulane. 5-0 and in Big 12 play. In the driver's seat, not just in the Big 12, but also potentially for a spot in the college football playoff if they had run the table. Now, you know, that Tulane loss isn't good, but still, I mean, they can very much. They're in the driver's seat, obviously, control the destiny, uh, control their own destiny to get to a Big 12 championship game for a potential rematch with TCU. But, man, uh, Kansas State... That was as impressive a performance that I've seen from any Big 12 team this year. That was, wow. I'm still just speechless. The spread was one and a half for crying out loud. And this was my one loss. So if you want to rag on me, I was on the Cowboys plus one and a half. But heck, Mike Gundy was 15 and two as an underdog, something like that, uh, you know, against the spread going back to 2018. Mike Gundy as an underdog was a lock. And it got completely embarrassed. I mean, that was unbelievable to watch that game play out on Saturday. I didn't see that coming at all. But it's a credit to Kansas State. Uh, Oklahoma State just had a bad game. I know the teams have bad games. I get it. But combined having a bad game, along with a lot of injuries, with Kansas State just clicking on all cylinders, ticked off, fired up coming out of that loss to TCU last week, and... uh, I mean, that was a complete bloodbath. And Chris Kleiman, man, he's having himself a heck of a season. A heck of a season. Last but not least on the uh, Big 12 Football Week 9 Reaction Show, Baylor beating Texas Tech 45-17. to So uh, this game was actually kind of close until Baylor put up 21 in the fourth quarter. It, I mean, it wasn't actually close. It was Baylor 17-3 at halftime. Tech had a good third quarter. Baylor ran away with it in uh, the fourth quarter. So uh, I liked Baylor in this game because I just felt like the line was off. It was Baylor plus two. I don't know why. I thought it should have been Baylor as the favorite. They're the better team, the deeper team. And I didn't buy into all the hoopla around, well, Patrick Mahomes Hall of Fame and Joy McGuire against his former guys. Like, that works kind of maybe to an extent. But, you know... Tech was off an enormous win against West Virginia. Baylor is still a team that believes it should be in the Big 12 title hunt. They have the talent to be in the Big 12 title hunt, and that's exactly what you saw on Saturday. If that team plays the way it did, um, you know, they they will stay in the hunts over the next month of the season. They will. Uh, Blake Shapin was sharp, 19-30, 211 yards with a score. The rushing attack was phenomenal. Richard Reese is quickly becoming a Big 12 star. 36 carries, 148 yards, three touchdowns. So uh, Baylor was on fire. They dominated time of possession, 2-1. to one. Uh, They won the turnover battle, 5-1. to one. Only a handful of penalties. I mean, everything in this game went Baylor's way. No doubt about it. Everything went Baylor's way and they ended up with a huge victory over the Red Raiders. So I'm looking at this game, and I'm saying to myself, this was an elimination game in the Big 12. Texas Tech is out of the Big 12 race now at 2-3. and three. Baylor stays in the mix at 3-2 and two in conference play. Now, they probably have to win out, but they're not eliminated. 
We're going into the final month of the season, and Baylor is in the Big 12 hunt. Of course, they're the defending champs. Their slip-up against West Virginia a couple of weeks ago was unfortunate. Blake Shapin got hurt in that game. If he doesn't get hurt, who knows how this thing is uh, playing out differently. But all in all, you look at this and you say to yourself, Baylor showed finally who a lot of us thought they could be and would be throughout most of the season. Um, you know, they got to the quarterback in a way that they haven't all year long that I thought they would be able to. I mean, they had six sacks on Saturday. They might have come into this game with six sacks. They had three quarterback hurries, eight tackles for loss. That's the defensive front I thought we'd see from Baylor all season that we didn't really see until Saturday. Now, what I thought was interesting is uh, Joy McGuire went to Donovan Smith, at quarterback, and Tyler Shuck, at quarterback, as well, uh, instead of Baron Morton. Now, Baron Morton got the start. He threw three picks, and then Shuck and Smith also got some action. I, I didn't like that move. You know, I think that this is the kind of year where Texas Tech was not going to be in Big 12 contention. The fact that they were even in the conversation at the end of October is a testament to what Joy McGuire and this coaching staff has done. But you got to ride Baron Morton. That guy's your future. You know the ceiling. You understand what it is. I'm not looking to crush his confidence right now. So I, I, I was surprised by that move. I didn't think it made a lot of sense. I know that he was struggling much of the night. He finished 11 of 34 for 152 yards and three picks, but it's not like Smith or Shuck looked any better. So I hope we're not looking at now a quarterback carousel at Tech. I would let Morton work through the rest of the season, understanding there's going to be some lumps along the way because that's what happens with young quarterbacks, but use it as a building block for the future. That's what I'd be doing at that position for the Red Raiders after uh, this 45-17 loss to the Baylor Bears on Saturday. So there you go, our Big 12 Football Week 9 recap and reaction show here on heartlandcollegesports.com. I'm Pete Mundo. A great week, an exciting week to be a Big 12 fan with this new media rights deal with ESPN and Fox in the books. And uh, believe in Brett, baby. That's our saying, believe in Brett Yormark. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. If you're on the podcast, leave that rating, review, subscribe, and that's how you get. You're looking at them now on Facebook and YouTube, one of these Heartland College sports koozies. The only way to get it is by rating and reviewing the podcast and sending me a screenshot to Pete Mundo, M-U-N-D-O, at heartlandcollegesports.com. Appreciate you guys. Have a great rest of your day. We've got a lot more content coming your way. Subscribe on YouTube. And uh, share on Facebook. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and the podcast. Take care. Talk to you guys soon. Have a great day.